This is part three of a study we've entitled The Promise Keepers and the Ecumenical Movement. And uh, if there's anybody that would like to read what any of our founding fathers have on the ecumenical movement, there are uh, two little uh, uh, books, actually a booklet and a book, by Pastor Stam on the New Evangelicalism. Now, he was writing this little booklet on what's known as Key 73. Any of you remember Key 73? Key 73 was a group of people, about the same people that are pushing the promise keepers, actually. And um, uh, they decided that they're going to unite together with all of the denominations and through the, by means of telephone, call everybody in the United States of America and confront them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, naturally, it was a big flop. Uh, just like any telephone um, businesses today trying to uh, solicit over the phone. Uh, people get mad at them and the like, and hey, I'm working, what are you, what are you doing calling me like this, uh, and so forth. Now, the intent was fine, but once again, they were um, all confused with regard to, well, what gospel message do we present, and what if the people do get saved, where do we send them to church, and the like, how do we follow this up? And it was a, a, a big mess. But anyway, Pastor Stam wrote this little booklet, The New Evangelicalism, Its Cause and Its Cure, in answer to Key 73. So you'll know it was written 1974. Uh, but uh, anyway, then he uh, wrote another one on uh, the present peril, the new evangelicalism. And he answers uh, getting together denominationally by what he calls the wrong kind of love. Uh, and uh, you, these are available in our uh, bookstore. And uh, uh, again, it addresses things like the promise keepers and why uh, we should s steer clear of it. It's not that we don't uh, see their intentions as good, uh, their, their motives with regard to, uh, to families as good. But in the long run, they deny the Apostle Paul they push the Great Commission, and worse, uh, the charismatic movement and the like, and uh, they, as he points out, are part of the program helping the harlot church to rise to power. Now, we noted it this morning under what we call trendy Christianity. Uh, there's somebody says, we should do it this way. And everybody says, well, hey, that's right. And they get on the bandwagon and go one direction. Paul calls that every wind and wave of doctrine. Somebody else says, well, now I'm a little bored with that. Let's change the program. This time we'll go this direction. It's anything new and improved to try to attract people. Have you ever heard that before? New and improved, Madison Avenue. You know, every time it's the same old product, but the, they had a few more grains of soap or something. And it's new and improved. Uh, sometimes it does work. But uh, the fact is, they get they get tired so they repackage the same product call it new and improved and it's supposed to attract customers they're going to try it out well christianity's that way instead of sticking with the book everybody in order to attract a crowd has to do what everybody wants to make it new and improved it's the madison avenue marketing technique for the local church it bypasses the Holy Spirit. It bypasses spirit-filled people. It bypasses the, the pastor teacher, the God-chosen one. And it bypasses the local Grace Church. But uh, anyway, it's to and fro and to and fro with every wind and wave of doctrine. So we looked and saw, and we should know this because we've studied it in one form or another uh, from time to time, that God has establishments for the express purpose of spiritual growth. And those establishments in the Old Testament were the temple, and in the New Testament, the local church. Now, the temple is a building that is permanent in Jerusalem that everybody needs to travel to and, uh, and keep the holy days of Jehovah. They had synagogues for their regular weekly Sabbath keeping. Uh, but uh, the principle is the same. There was a special place that God designed in order for people to go there. Now, they were to do two things. Number one, they were to keep the purity of temple worship as God said it. Jesus said, you've made it something other than what God made it. You made it a, a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. 
And then uh, you're not to stray from temple worship by going to somewhere else where there is another God, other doctrine, other practices, taking people away from the temple with their, their um, uh, time, talents, treasures, and the like. Okay, the same principle is true in the dispensation of grace. That there, and, and the problem with uh, this, as we've mentioned before, is that there are some of these things that are worthy of our prayers and support. Naturally, missions agencies, some parachurch uh, agencies, uh, other... Even, even Acts 2, Acts 13 churches, some of them basically hold what we hold to but doctrinally. Uh, and uh, of course, a home Bible class, I think of, of Dave Wilson up there. They don't have a, a church building, but they, they meet in a home, but they're organized as a church for the express purpose of leaving the home, going to a building they can call a church. Uh, so we have to be careful. It is a home Bible class, uh, technically, but it's not for skipping church. It's not bypassing the pastor teacher. Uh, the pastor is there leading his people to not only have they started a church, but they want to move to a church building. So the thing that we uh, are warned of uh, by the Apostle Paul is we need to keep the local church as God has designed it a classroom for spiritual academics taught by a teacher. That is what the didaskalos means. It's a school teacher, but the subject matter is spiritual and biblical. So that is the main thrust. It's not that you can't do some other things in a local church from time to time. You can, of course. Uh, and, and it's not that you can't have some of these uh, type of agencies in the church, like we have missionaries and they speak on the field. Sure you can but the routine of the Christian way of life is Bible study in the local church. And when you either change that format or you get people more excited about meeting at these other places, taking people away from the local Grace Church, you hurt uh, people. You hurt the congregation. You hurt the pastor. You hurt their means of promoting the Grace message. So we'll move on here. Thus we noted that uh, today there is a phenomenon, and this uh, phenomenon is, uh, has to do with men. And uh, again, it's one of those wave things where, uh, of course, at, at one time men were tyrants and suppressed women, and now women want their just due, and so they're, they're suppressing men. Uh, and uh, men are, want to keep women simply as, uh, as slaves, and now women want to make men as slaves. Now, I'm speaking generally. Not every woman wants to do that. But there has to be a cause for this reaction, and it's across the board uh, in the secular world, in the Islamic world, in the Christian world. Men don't know who, uh, who they are and they're supposed to. So you have the male bonding movement where you dress up like an Indian, go to the woods, uh, uh, beat the tom-tom and say, I'm OK, you're OK. And uh, it's, it's supposed to make things all better. Uh, on the other hand, the Million Man March, where uh, the um, Muslims take an oath that they're going to be better husbands, better fathers, not shoot anybody, quit their gambling, straighten up their lives, and the like. And then the promise keepers. But again, all of it, uh, for the most part, is built simply on emotion, uh, the desire to do better, to make a better world, but it leaves out God. Even with the promise keepers, they will say, well, we don't teach doctrine. Well, the, the problem with that is, how can you meet together in the name of Christ and not teach his word? That's, that is a big problem. Well, if you start teaching this, then, uh, then this per person is going to get offended. Well, why don't you teach the truth and let those who get offended get offended and let the chips fall where they may? That is the point. Quit trying to change it in order to accommodate. So we then saw that... Uh, it actually started all the way back with a creature by the name of Lucifer who wanted to put God down. God, you don't know who you are. I'm better than you. And build himself up. And then with Eve, who wanted to put her husband down and promote herself. And uh, as a result, God cursed the woman with this. And this has been going on since. 
And, and men lose their identity, women lose their identity, and thinking they're something they're not, men do the very same thing. The answer is to find your identity in Christ and be who God made you. Now, that brought us then to this uh, point here. God's standard. Now, there are many such verses that we could go to uh, in the scripture, many such portions. But I know of none better than in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 16. Be ye not, excuse me, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, there is the key to understanding separation. Naturally, we work with unbelievers. Uh, so we're, we're going to have to uh, have some attachment to them. Sometimes people marry an unbeliever. Well, yeah, don't get a divorce. Uh, stick in there and, and uh, pray that the spouse, male or female, will believe on Christ and, and the like. What it's talking about basically is a cooperative effort, effort in spiritual things. Now, it applies to marriage and, and other things, but it's basically in spiritual things. It is a portion that is a, a prime example of why not to be involved with the ecumenical movement. Why? Well, it says, What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. Now again, it trickles down, it filters down, it applies to all relationships to be sure, but naturally we cannot quit working with unbelievers, we can't quit talking to unbelievers, we have to get to know them, we have to pray for them in order to witness to them. Well, what's this talking, what is it talking about then? It's talking about cooperative efforts religiously. Righteousness with unrighteousness. What is righteousness? It is divine thinking. It is proper thinking. And that means proper doctrine. A, a person can sit in church, support a church that doesn't teach the truth, and they're unrighteous. That's what it is. And uh, for the life of me, I have never in my life uh, have had a harder time in my ministry pointing that out. We can always point to the carouser and say, oh boy, that, that person, that, he is unrighteous. And it's true in some cases, yes, that's fine. He is an unrighteous person doing those things. But righteousness is divine thinking. And God knows what to think. He's not double-minded. He doesn't think one way in this case and another way in this case. Uh, uh, he has believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, period. That is righteousness. So what are we doing then with people who don't believe in by grace through faith salvation? That is unrighteousness. Did, did you ever think that that's what unrighteousness is? It is thinking wrong theological thoughts. It is, it is telling a lie about things like salvation. Okay, the next thing. It says, what communion has light with darkness. The fact of the matter is, light and darkness cannot have communion. Did you know that? There is no such thing as light and darkness having communion. Either the darkness will uh, quell the light, or the light will disperse the darkness. It's either or. Uh, and so, therefore, the Apostle Paul is saying, you, uh, you cannot have fellowship with those who walk in darkness. They're children of darkness. Uh, they don't walk in the truth. You're children of light. Therefore, let your light so shine. But you can't let it shine when you have to dim the wick, as it were, uh, at, in order to walk around those in darkness so that you don't offend them. Because if you let your light shine, those in darkness are going to be offended. Hey, boy, the light hurts. Let's put the light out. So you cannot have communion between these two. The next it says, what concord or unity has Christ with Belial? Christ means the anointed one, the worthy one, and Belial means the worthless one. Now, uh, we've been involved in teaching you secondary cussing. <laughs> Said if you want to fool somebody, you just say, uh, 
well, you know, Tophet is hot. And you haven't told them to go to hell, you told them to go to Tophet. Well, synonymously, it's the same thing. And don't do it, of course. Uh, but here, if somebody gets uh, under your skin and they are really uh, a pain in the neck, you can always say, well, you're an SOB. Now, what is that? That's the son of Belial. And Belial means worthless. A, a child of the worthless one. He is a leader, but uh, uh, Jesus calls him Beelzebub. He leads the flies on the dunghill. Oh, boy, that's a great title to have, Beelzebub. That's what Belial is. He's the leader of the flies, and the flies own the dunghill. It's really worthwhile. Well, that's what a son of Belial is. But why do you try to unite Jesus Christ, the altogether lovely one, the perfect pure one, with Belial, the totally worthless one? And that's what we're trying to do in uniting ecumenically in that sense. All right? Note, it says, what, uh, or what part, none, speaking rhetorically, has the believer in Jesus Christ with an unbeliever. Uh, I mean, we can't sanction what they do in the spiritual realm. We can't take part in what they do in attempting to work for their salvation, corrupt the word of God, twist it to their own destruction, as Peter says. Then the temple of God with the temple of, of idols. Uh, many unsaved people are demon-possessed, and they these unsaved people teaching false salvation messages come right into the promise keepers and... Uh, they're demon-possessed. That's where they get their uh, doctrine, instead of the temple of God. That is, you actually have trusted Christ, and the Spirit of God is in His rightful place. Verse um, 16. Now, why do this? Because it has everything to do with spirit filling. Ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, okay, that's salvation, and walk in them, that's spirit filling, you see. Walk in the spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Dwell in them, that's salvation, walk in them, that's spirit filling. Now, if you don't have a right salvation message, God doesn't dwell in you, and he can't until you believe on Christ by grace through faith. And the Spirit of God does not control your life. He cannot walk in you unless you have the right message of sanctification. None of these on this side have it. So you must do what? Verse number 17, Wherefore, by way of conclusion, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And in this cooperative spiritual effort, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, let's go to, from this point to 1 Timothy. And with this, let's look at another of God's standards. On the one hand, we're going to look at what is called heresy, and on the other hand, we're going to look at what is called apostasy. Technically, they are different, and you have to understand that there are degrees of both. And Let's, uh, let me explain uh, this to you as we read um, 1 Timothy 4, chapter, uh, <laughs> 1 Timothy verse 4, chapter 1. No, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, and if we're right, we're close to the end. We're in the latter times. Some shall depart, that is the word, to apostatize. And it means to, incrementally, in a measured fashion, uh, leave the standard of the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So, it simply means that uh, there are degrees from the truth. 
Now, there, there are brethren that are Acts 2 brethren. Are they apostates? Yes, they are. <laughs> but they're not that far from us. In many cases, in many circles, they uh, simply say, well, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. Their gospel is Pauline. And they will say, any other religious work or ritual or rite does not count for salvation. But if you're going to amount to a hill of beans for God in your Christian life, you've got to be scripturally baptized. Well, what is that? That is not true. That's apostasy. But it's not with regard to salvation. Well, shall we say it's not that far from the truth? Okay, you're saved, uh, but uh, you're not going to amount to a hill of beans anyway in a lot of, in a lot of ways. But uh, sure, we'll give you this. You are definitely saved. However, there's somebody way out here who says, unless you are baptized, you cannot be saved. You meet the blood of Christ when you meet the waters of baptism. Or as they do in, in uh, other churches, unless you were baptized as a young person to take care of original sin, or, or christened as a young person to place you, uh, instead of being circumcised, you now are placed in relation to the covenant by christening and that. And that means you've taken care of your original sin. That is a marked departure from the truth. Those people are not saved. You cannot be saved by saying uh, you meet the blood at the waters of baptism. And so that is a great apostasy. You cannot have fellowship with those kind of people. Now, uh, that type of apostasy then is turns into heresy. So we turn to Titus chapter 3. When that message is pushed instead of the true gospel message. When apostasy opposes the truth in a vehement way, then it becomes rank heresy in, in trying to suppress the truth. One is a departure. Uh, how far makes it how bad it is. The further uh, it goes, the worse it gets. But that is a departure from the truth. It becomes heresy when it begins to confront the truth and tries to defeat it and suppress it and annihilate the truth. That is heresy. Therefore, it says, Titus 3, verse 10, a man that is a heretic. Now, obviously, if there was not a chance to apostatize, the Apostle Paul wouldn't have told us that some were going to depart or be apostates. Obviously, if it were not possible for a man to be a heretic, the Apostle Paul would, would never have written then uh, that a man could be. A man that is a heretic. After the first and second admonition, reject. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means that it, you try to... Uh, a witness uh, to this person. And one time he said, nope, I don't believe in grace through faith. I believe in baptismal regeneration, which is a standard church of Christ, Christian church, disciples of Christ type of theology. Okay, you come again and say, now let, let's discuss this. We've been praying together. Let's discuss this. Nope, I reject. Third time I rejected. Well, uh, long about that time, the Apostle Paul says, uh, you ought to start working on somebody else. Doesn't mean that you simply give up on them. You can continue to pray. And if they ask you to talk again, fine, that's well and good. But as far as trying to uh, beat a dead horse, kick a dead dog, forget it. Knowing that he that is such is subverted, verse 11, and sins being condemned of himself. What does that mean? He himself with his own mouth witnesses that he doesn't know the truth, is not following the truth, and has rejected the truth. He is an uh, opposer of the truth. Now, uh, as it goes, that uh, becomes the even more serious crime. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Verse number 18, the wrath of God is revealed. The truth about judgment to come 
is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Ungodliness is spirit. God is a spirit, spirituality. Unrighteousness is truth, divine thinking. God is spirit and truth. And so those people who hate spirituality and true doctrine, heaven itself reveals the wrath of God against those people. But note what they do. They are heretics. Not only have they apostatized by uh, verse number 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie. Worshiped and served the creature. Verse 23, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God to uh, uh, an image made like to corruptible man and so forth. But then they became not just apostates, but heretics. Note the last phrase in verse 18. Who hold, literally, who hold down, who suppress it, who, uh, who try to bridle it, who try to put a lid on it, who try to, ha uh, to, to, um, to hide it, and so forth. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So uh, that becomes heresy, and you're uh, uh, an active heretic when you begin suppressing the truth. That's why. When you go to the, the ecumenical thing, you have to shut up about, you have to suppress the truth. Because if you, if you tell the truth, you're going to get in an argument with those who are apostates. But not only that, you're especially going to confront those who, uh, who oppose the truth. Now, come with me to Acts chapter 13. Just, uh, just this is just a little by the by here. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> I, I must have been enjoying it because I, I don't know where my time is gone. Verse 6. When they had gone through the isle into Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus. He desired to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, that's his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn the deputy from the faith. You see, he himself was an apostate, and then he, uh, the man wanted to hear the truth of the word of God. He became a heretic. Now, a heretic holds opposing views, but he became active in the sense that he began to suppress the truth. Don't listen to these men, he's saying to, to the deputy here. Now, uh, Paul set his eyes on him, filled with the Holy Ghost, full of all subtlety and mischief, child of the devil, enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Hey, get with the system. Quit opposing the truth. Quit departing from the truth. Get with the truth. And then, if you're not going to get with it yourself, would you please leave this guy alone? He wants the truth. Now, as it turned out, it says, verse 12, the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. That is getting with the system. And the system is the truth. Now, obviously, Bar Jesus had a religion. Obviously, Bar Jesus had uh, uh, false spiritual doctrines and tendencies. If it's okay for just anybody to worship anything and say anything religiously, and you put your stamp of approval on it, why did the Apostle Paul strike him blind? Why did he call him full of all subtlety and mischief? Why did he call him a child of the devil? Somebody would say, well, that's not nice. We're not supposed to cut these people down. Well, that's true. Not some sort of personal attack. Though well, this definitely was. Why are you? Why won't you stop perverting the righteous ways of God? Quit being an apostate, departing from the truth. Quit being a heretic and holding opposing views and trying to suppress it. Okay. Now, we're we're going to have a part four on Wednesday, but um, I had a question going. Um, uh, from the service uh, this morning. And it's, a, it's something that I myself have wrestled with a long time. It is a good question. And uh, I, I would like to address that for the few moments I have, then we'll have part four on Wednesday night. Okay. 
The question is uh, simply this. If um, it is wrong, and I mentioned a, a guy by the name of Max Lucado, if it is wrong to buy a Max Lucado book, uh, would it be wrong then to say, uh, as, as we have done, uh, read a gem from somebody with opposing theological views? Well, we're going to cover that in one moment, but we're going to go back up to, to this and, and try to help. Remember, that is um, what my ministry is about. I majored in theology, in ethics, in apologetics, so that I could wrestle with these questions. And I, and I wrestle with them. Everything we do as a church, I wrestle with because I want to have my life and our lives together in line with doctrine and I want to have our doctrine in line with the Bible and that's important that's called consistency uh, other than that we're inconsistent and could end up being hypocrites so let's take a let's take an illustration of restaurants that are out there first of all there are some restaurants say a Shoney's that have food for sale but no no liquor can you go in a shoney's do you want to go in a shoney's <laughs> okay maybe we can think of a better one but uh, for the sake of illustration uh, you understand the principle all they want to do is sell you food and uh, and the beverages they have are non-alcoholic yes without question you can go in there all right the next is there are various shades of restaurants in this town that have bars associated with them. If you go down here to Chi Chi's, you go through some swinging doors there, and uh, there is a bar and some, some tables, and then on the other side is the family room. Uh, but there is alcohol throughout the place, probably more drinking in the bar area than there is uh, so forth. Well now, they have both food and liquor, there are other places, and, um, and I've been there with many of you, that, uh, that sometimes they, they have uh, more toward the bar than the food. But can you go in there? Absolutely. But you have to be cautious because uh, you have to understand what they're trying to do. Their, their express purpose is perhaps not to get you drunk, but to sell you uh, uh, alcoholic beverages that they can attach a little higher price to, and, and food. So yes, with caution, you're not going to uh, sit at the bar sloshing them down with the rest of the patrons of the place. Uh, you're there for food, and if you happen to order a glass of wine or whatever, fine, well and good. Okay, now, on the other hand, you have a bar. It doesn't say bar and grill, it just says bar. And uh, uh, it's there for one express purpose. No food unless it's chips, but liquor. That's all they want to do is push liquor. They make more money on how much liquor they can get you to consume. That is their major goal. Okay, so uh, uh, for the most part, no, you cannot go in there. Now with exceptions. Um, again, I would say if you've got a relative in there uh, that is uh, down in the mouth and down in the dumps and <clears throat> they don't need the, they, they don't know they need salvation and but uh, they have called you and said, look, will you talk with me? I say go. That's an exception to the rule. Go in there. Open your Bible. Don't be afraid to do so and witness for Jesus Christ. Now, again, don't uh, belly up to the bar of elbow to elbow trying to to drink with them. But that's an exception. Bonafide. But basically, you cannot support it as a Christian. It is only there for the sale of alcoholic beverages to make people drunk. That's a difference. Okay, now I've said all that to say, let's do the very same thing with the moments that we have left here. Uh, and I think my clock is still on Eastern Standard Time or whatever. I think I have five minutes. Let's look and compare the, the two things because I want, I want our lives to be consistent and uh, I want to do what's right myself. Now, of course, the best thing to do, and here is the key, 
is not to get involved in any cooperative effort. That is the key. Don't be unequally yoked. Where an unbeliever has a say in what you do in religious or spiritual matters. That is the principle. If, a, if an unbeliever or an apostate or a heretic says, no, you're not going to do this, you're going to do the other. Uh, then you have to say, wait one second, that's an un unequal yoke. I cannot be part of it. Now, that's why there is a difference between, say, buying a book and renting a gym from, from a church. Now, let's just note the difference. On the one hand, when you buy the book, it is for the express purpose of a permanent possession. That's why you purchase it. You want to keep it in your home. Now, uh, if you want to study it so that you can refute uh, that, sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes I have to buy books. Uh, like Warren Wiersbe said, you have to read your enemy if you know how to, know how to do, defeat him. You have, to, you have to know what they stand for, or else you're talking off the top of your head and uh, beating your gums. You have to know what you're talking about. So that involves doing that. However, you buy it with the jaundiced eye of I'm buying it to get this position so I can refute it. That's apologetics. Okay, it's a permanent thing. On the other hand, when you, when you simply like rent a gym, or as in the case of like Dave Wilson there, I think that they have, they have rented uh, uh, other church buildings, other church base. I think they've even been in the, the lodge up there. And Dave doesn't believe in that. But he's not trying to support the Masonic Lodge. He is simply trying to get a meeting room and he is paying for a service, which is temporary. So in that case, it makes it somewhat different. Okay, going back here, and we'll go through these quickly. Buying a book and reading it means that you are under the author's control. The whole purpose of writing a book is so the author will get you to think his thoughts. Now, you know, not all not all books are wrong uh, there. And and uh, again, sometimes you do have to read the opposing viewpoint, but you have to understand where this guy is coming from. If it is say Max Lucado, he is coming from a, a viewpoint that says baptism is the key to salvation. And that, and because that doesn't get you salvation, and he is, in fact, unsaved, that's going to color his theology. Because the purpose of that book is to spread his theology to you and to me, and he controls our thinking. On the other hand, whenever you rent something, the control falls back on the renter. And in other words, uh, nobody from the church or the, the lodge or what have you can tell you what you're going to do in that room. Control is in your hands and it makes it different. Uh, as you can see, I've wrestled with this for years now because I want to do it in literally years. I want to do what's right. But it falls back into the hands of the renter as long as the renter controls it and, and tells the landlord, look, <laughs> We're going to have a service here. I paid for this room and uh, we're, we're not doing anything unspiritual, illegal or immoral. And you must keep your proverbial nose beyond the door as long as I'm, uh, we're doing this OK. The renter has charge. All right. Next, when you buy a book with the author, a, a knowing heretic, because the book is his suppression of the truth. He has already departed from the faith. Now he has to suppress the real truth that, that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. So therefore, the content of his book is false doctrine. Now, again, not every unsaved person, either in the secular or religious realm, uh, speaks lies in every area. Sometimes they'll root around and find an acorn of truth that, that you can use. But you have to be careful. Uh, uh, as to who you're quoting and how that person, the author of the book, relates it to spiritual things. So the content of a, a book, say by this author, probably contains false doctrine. Whereas, uh, especially if you, <laughs> if you were at uh, 
our thing that's passed right there was no doctrine there it was all physical and believe you me the all of us who are aging <laughs> uh, woke up the next morning and knew that it was purely physical there wasn't anything doctrinal there except for this uh, that there was a good spirit uh, uh, nobody got angry even when they got stuffed or what have you it was kind of hard again as I said with regard to Miss Lucy when she'd go yes then, then it was tough. So, so you know, Miss Lucy's doing this. Yeah. The content. there It was just simply there for a relaxing time of fellowship, again, amongst like-minded people. The last thing we, we want to note here is with regard to the purpose. And that, again, makes the difference. Now, the, the whole thing is we must be careful how we spend our money, uh, especially as a church. And that's a good principle, and we must think it through. But when you buy a book, you're buying a book for the express purpose of having that author to speak to you. And there is a measure of influence there. And uh, when you start having people with false doctrine influencing you, eventually you bring that false doctrine into your life and it filters right into the church and you begin saying things and teaching things that aren't true. And you know where you recalled it? You recalled it because you filled your mind. Why do you think that, uh, that um, uh, young people can remember the words to songs? Because they hear it over and over and over again. And uh, that, that means there's influence there. And it's the same thing with regard to a book. The express purpose of the book is influence. However, uh, aside from just simply a relaxing time of fellowship, the purpose uh, of the rental is uh, no influence at all. In other words, no outside person brought any influence to bear on what uh, we did with the gym, aside from, uh, uh, you know, we can't tear up the carpet, spray paint graffiti on the walls, you know, uh, tear down the, the volleyball net and the like. Again, the, the question is good, and thinking through these things is good, as, as I have done for years. But basically, this, this is why that there is if there would be any uh, uh, compromise at all, it would be very, very minimal. But we do have to watch how we spend our money. And if possible, uh, don't, don't be yoked with unbelievers. Don't be yoked with false theology, if at all possible. But just like with these three up here, uh, you can do some things uh, without, uh, with regard to unbelievers without, or, you know, uh, even a, uh, um, believers who are not theologically correct um, and still uh, be okay with the Lord.